Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with Matt Powell's The Atheist Religion video. If you're new to the series, I'm putting it in a nice little playlist that should make watching them in order easy, so go ahead and start with part one. For everyone else, this is when we get to the next segment of Matt's video titled The Big Bang Theory. Going in, my assumption is that he's going to claim that there is no evidence for the Big Bang, therefore we must have faith in the Big Bang, therefore atheism is a religion. Let's see if I'm right. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. That is an oversimplification to the point of error. The most egregious problem with that statement is that this is when all matter, energy, space, and time were created. That makes it sound like the Big Bang is what created all the stuff, but the reality of the situation is that we don't really know what came before the Big Bang. The singularity is one hypothesis, but it is by no means the only one. And either way, I can guarantee that Matt is going to jump on the statement that energy was created here on the grounds that this violates the laws of thermodynamics. Really, the only thing about the Big Bang that violates thermodynamics is when you misunderstand the Big Bang. So strictly speaking, with regards to what the video he is playing has just stated, he would be technically correct. That would constitute the violation of thermodynamics. But as it turns out, the statement in that video is incorrect. So the Big Bang theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton. Yeah, that's the simplified explanation, but really there are several hypotheses that don't involve singularities, and the singularity is more of an indication of our lack of understanding of physics at those scales than anything else. So sure, if you don't look any further into it than what you have just said, then you have a correct enough to teach a third grader explanation that is easy to deconstruct. And then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the size of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. Who here thinks that's just logical and scientific? Well, it's supported by the evidence, so yes, it is scientific, even if it doesn't appeal to our intuition. Your ability to phrase an oversimplification of the process in a way that makes it sound unscientific does not actually make it unscientific. And remember, your alternative hypothesis is that just 6,000 years ago, God made a person out of dirt, then paraded a bunch of animals in front of him to see which ones appealed to him the most, but none did. So he took one of the dirt man's ribs and made a woman out of it, and then a talking snake with legs convinced the woman to eat the fruit from the tree of everything can go fuck itself, and that's why snakes don't have legs and thorns exist and childbirth hurts. Does that sound logical and scientific? Your misunderstanding of the Big Bang sounds more plausible than what you are actually proposing. Explosions don't create natural law and order, they create chaos. Well, let's start out by playing this clip of a steel sphere being explosively hydroformed. Great, so now that we've determined that explosions can form things, let's move on to the fact that nobody is claiming that an explosion is responsible for the order and the laws of the universe, okay? But yet we have unchanging laws. Where did these laws come from? Where did they arise? Dunno. That's the real answer. We don't know. You don't know. You sure like to pretend you know, but you have no evidence to back up your assertion, so I may as well suggest that they came from the flying spaghetti monster. I mean, there are actual models for the universe that attempt to answer this question. The bouncing cosmology model, for instance, suggests that the universe is cyclical, with each cycle being mostly the same as the one before it, but also slightly different, which could mean that the universe is in a process of potentially endlessly cycling between different variants, meaning that eventually it would get to the universal variant that we currently exist in. Cosmic inflation posits that there is a cosmos beyond our universe that is going through inflation, and as it inflates, it creates offshoot universes with all of the potential values for the various constants, meaning that each offshoot universe will have slightly different laws of physics, and so we live in the offshoot universe that is capable of sustaining our form of life. The cosmic inflation model is, at this time, untestable and unfalsifiable, so it's not really anything more than an interesting thought experiment, but the bouncing cosmology model makes predictions that could potentially be tested in the future, so we'll see where this goes. 
Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Yet in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from that tiny point to something billions of miles across? Yeah, because space can expand faster than the speed of light without the things contained within this space traveling faster than the speed of light. It's not intuitive, but that's how it is. It's not even scientifically possible. You know, 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on Earth right now. So for somebody to believe that those gallons of water were all condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space, smaller than a single proton, that takes great faith. That takes great belief. Sure, it would. Thankfully, though, not a single person who actually understands anything about the Big Bang believes that there was any water compressed there. Water would not have been able to exist until well after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is something that happened shortly after the initial expansion. And even then, you need oxygen to make water. Big Bang nucleosynthesis only got us hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, and the beryllium that was produced then would have been unstable and would have decayed back into lithium. So no, we don't even get water after Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The first round of stars to form after the Big Bang would have produced the universe's first supply of oxygen. Only then could water form, and we're talking two to five hundred million years after the Big Bang here. Get this too. What if I said nothing caused something behind this piano to explode? What if I said nothing caused it? Then that would be silly. You'd say, man, that's crazy. That's weird. But that's literally what they believe. They believe that nothing exploded and that there was no God. So nothing had to cause nothing to explode. Let me ask you, viewer, did anything I said in this video so far give you the impression that I believe that nothing caused nothing to explode into everything? If so, then sorry, I must have worded something poorly because that's not what most people think. Remember how Matt Powell himself described it earlier? So the Big Bang Theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton, and then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the size of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. What part of that started with nothing? Now, if one of the singularity models of the early universe turns out to be correct, where did the singularity come from? We don't know. It's possible that space-time just breaks down when it gets compressed that small, making a beginning or a question of what came before a logical absurdity. It's possible that the bouncing cosmology model is correct and we are merely one of a series of consecutive universes to exist, potentially stretching indefinitely into the past and the future. And yes, one hypothesis does propose that the universe literally came from nothing. That comes from the fact that when you add up all the positive and negative energy in the universe, it appears to balance out to zero, meaning that the total energy of the universe is zero, meaning that the appearance of the universe out of nothing does not break the laws of thermodynamics. Big Bang Theory is just a reminder that these people have decided what truth is, and they will use any explanation that does not include God, and the fact that the Big Bang is all they can come up with, it just is a reminder to me that there is no other explanation except that there is a God and that this is his creation. That position shows that not only do you have a piss-poor understanding of the subject, but also that you aren't even trying to learn anything about it. There are several hypotheses about the beginning of the universe that are quite different from the typical Big Bang model, and it takes almost zero effort to find them. But McMurtry here might have been distracted by some pumpkins or something, so sure, you can be forgiven for thinking that that explanation is the only one we have. But to suggest that this explanation is a result of us trying really, really hard to come up with just any old explanation that avoids positing a god betrays your complete and utter ignorance on this topic even more. The Big Bang was first proposed by a devout Catholic priest, George Lemaitre. NASA scientist Robert Jastrow was convinced by the Big Bang that there was evidence for the supernatural creation of the universe. The Big Bang is not an atheistic idea. If we were just looking for something that could omit God completely and we didn't care about any of the evidence, we probably would have stuck with the steady state model of the universe rather than going with the Big Bang. Like what if I said nothing caused something over here to explode? Okay, it's highly answer. unlikely. No, it's impossible. I would say it's highly unlikely. I would not say impossible. So this is Ethan of the Your Friendly Neighborhood Atheist YouTube channel. He seems like a genuinely nice guy. He also put out a video discussing his involvement in Matt's project here. It's about six minutes long, but let's just play a couple snippets for now. He had approached me a couple weeks before filming and uh, said he needed an atheist and no other atheist would speak to him. 
and he just wanted to sit down and interview someone for his upcoming movie. And I, I prefaced that with him prior to sitting down. I'm like, look, dude, science isn't my jam. I, I'm new to all of this. I am learning. So if you want to stick on science, I, I don't know how much I could contribute to that conversation. But for most of the interview, it kept going back to that and to thermodynamics. And I, sh I should have, I should have known better, but I didn't. And it's, it's okay. Okay, so here we have Ethan, a guy who has informed Matt that he doesn't really specialize in the scientific areas, so he would prefer not to discuss the intricate details of various aspects of science. And here's Matt asking him science questions that he has already stated he isn't the best at answering. And of course, we already know from our history with Matt that Matt always edits his videos to make his guests look their best and brightest, right? Do you think artificial intelligence always requires a designer? Before Ethan answers, I would say that yes, artificial intelligence requires a designer of some kind. It's right there in the name, artificial. Generally speaking, when people call something artificial, they are referring to something that has been made by human beings rather than by nature. That's the primary definition of artificial. So by definition, artificial intelligence would have to be designed by human beings, or it wouldn't be artificial. I'd, yeah. Um. But intelligence doesn't. Like actual intelligent beings don't require a designer. So, we don't know. And there you go. You now have a clip of a guy who told you he wouldn't know science stuff saying, I don't know, when you ask him a science question. What it really comes down to is that intelligence is actually a really complicated topic. It can be hard to figure out what intelligence even is. Is it pattern recognition? Is it the amount of trivia you know without having to look it up? Is it how quickly you can do math problems? Is it your reading comprehension level? What Matt probably really means here is just complex interactions in our brains that give us the perception of being conscious, which is a less nebulous term than intelligence. And yeah, our brains are a product of evolution. You can believe that evolution was guided by a god if you want, but this is an unnecessary assumption. Your, your statement, you said atheists believe something came from, from nothing. That's, that's not accurate. Um, I, I don't recall any ever, ever any atheists specifically. I can name 10 right now that say that something came from nothing. Oh, you can name 10, can you? Okay, let's hear the list. Do you really believe that something came from nothing? Yes. Okay, there's one, assuming that guy was an atheist. I don't actually know who that was, so I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay, I guess we're done with that part. You could have at least added Lawrence Krauss to your list. He's the easy one. He literally wrote the book on it. So I guess that's where I'll leave it for now, too. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Thunderwitch, who says, what's the quickest way to tell whether a message is true or false? Not valuing how fast we can get to an answer is a good start. Yup. Oftentimes, people on both sides of the aisle can be guilty of this, of taking a clip of an atheist or a Christian hemming and hawing before answering as evidence that they don't know what they're talking about, rather than as evidence that they are carefully considering their answer and want to make sure they get it across as accurately as possible. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the bangs that make my channel big. If you'd like to big bang me, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!